So we're happy to welcome Dustin Freckleton here and his wife, Crystal. I think they've got other friends and family members that have taken an opportunity to come visit with them as they've come back from Texas to be here with us today. So one morning, during his first year of medical school, Dustin Freckleton woke up with a splitting headache. Standing in front of his mirror, he realized his horizon was at an angle and that he was having a stroke. Experiencing this personal health crisis at 24 years old made Freckleton think less about becoming a surgeon and more about how he could help prevent others from needing to enter the hospital. So he began LDL Technologies, Inc., a company that develops wearable sensors with real-time measurements of the body's critical bio-signals. Freckleton's experience and career path have taught him how to embrace uncertainty. I think it's a human nature to avoid uncertainty, he said. It's human nature to settle or retreat, to comfort. I've had to learn to stare into the abyss of uncertainty and find the grit to keep moving forward. Uh, he and his wife and four children live in Austin, Texas, and we're grateful to have him here. Now, before I turn the time over to him to give us his uh, lecture, I wanted to present him with a token of appreciation from our colleague. So, Dustin, I'm going to ask you to come up here where we'll do the unveiling. <laughs> it's right here. Okay? So, this is a replica of the cougar that's out of this uh, west of the Marriott Center. Yeah, I have one in my office. But mine doesn't have this engraving. <laughs> these, uh, these actually are fairly heavy. We can help you ship it. <laughs> but you can, just, you. you can just pick it up by the So thank you so much for being here. So I'm going to now turn the time over to Dustin. Um, I've never given a lecture before. <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is unique, so bear with me here. Um, I'm grateful to be here with you today. As a physician, I have no problem giving shots. Um, and especially in my training, I gave a lot of shots. Um, but I have to tell you that no matter how many times I've given a shot, I hate getting them. And I feel a little bit like I'm on the receiving end of the needle today. Um, and so uh, hopefully uh, you bear with me. But I want to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Porter, to BYU, to the College of Life Sciences for inviting me here to be with you today. And I want to express a special appreciation to all of you uh, for lending a few minutes of your time. And I hope I can make it worth your while. Um, so, I'm going to start off with just a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from BYU in 2008 with a bachelor's degree in neuroscience. Um, some of my favorite memories of BYU were probably neuroanatomy lab with Dr. Brown, and probably number two would be doing mouse surgeries on the top of the swicket with Dr. Stephenson. Um, that probably is a little bit TMI, but that kind of tells you a little bit about me and how I'm wired. After I graduated from, uh, from, uh, from BYU, I went on to medical school, did my training at the University of Texas at Houston, um, where I graduated in 2013 with an MD, MBA. And um, when I was, since I was a kid, I always knew that I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. And whether I was you know, young growing up or I was in med school, anybody who knew me well knew that that's what I was going to be and that's what I wanted to do. Um, but much to my good fortune, well, my life took a little bit of a different path. And um, that's kind of what I want to talk to you a little bit about today, are some thoughts on maintaining sanity in an uncertain, unpredictable world. And how do we deal with all of the twists and the turns and the surprises that come along the way? Um, I'm naturally somebody who loves stability. I love to control the world around me. I like to put everything in neat little boxes and set it on the shelf, everything in its own proper place. Um, and I 
if I'm being honest with myself, and I'm being honest with you, no small part of this small success that I have found so far in my professional career has been because of my ability to resist that urge and to buck that trend and to try to embrace and accept unpredictability in my life. And that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so after graduation, I decided to hang up my white coat and attack the healthcare industry from a little bit different angle. I am founder of, and up until last Friday, CEO of a startup company called Level Technologies. We're based out of Austin, Texas, and we're a healthcare analytics company. We have unique expertise in sensor and signal optimization, which allows us to be able to find signals in sensors and correlate those to complex health outcomes that consumers and patients really care about. And I think for us that that's a really important distinction because we believe that all patients were consumers first. And all patients will be consumers again. And I think that's a critical way to think about healthcare. It really drives a lot of the way that we approach our work. With our technology stack, we can both directly measure things that are incredibly valuable to human health and well-being, as well as, it, as, well as indirectly um, measure them through systems level heuristics. So direct measurements, things like Heart rate, heart rate variability, pulse oximetry, right? These are kind of st table stakes in the industry, not too, not too interesting. But some of the derived work is what I get really excited about. Things like measuring hydration, emotional um, uh, emotion, sleep, stress, the pro progress or regression of symptoms of mental illness. These are some of the things that are really groundbreaking that we're working on at Level Technologies. And I think is important because we recognize that health is not a single metric. It really is representative of an entire individual. And in order to understand how somebody is doing, including from a well-being or a health perspective, you have to understand all of that in context of each other. At Level, we have raised $13.7 million to date. Um, and last Friday, we successfully sold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So I am no longer CEO of Level Technologies. I'm now Chief Science Officer of a stealth mode, stealth mode startup led by Sean Rad, the former co-founder and CEO of Tinder. Some of you may be familiar with that app. Um, and um, we are, we just raised $50 million, five zero, um, in venture financing from one of the leading biotech funds in the country. And we did that to be able to attack healthcare from a new angle, looking at mind and body health and creating breakthroughs using AI, biometrics, and clinical sciences. So I'm really excited to be able to continue doing the work that we have been doing. Um, but as proud as I am of those accomplishments, where I derive the most pleasure in my life and the most joy, I know it sounds cliche, but it's with my family. Um, I have a wonderful wife, Crystal, um, who is here with me. She's probably blushing and she'll actually hate another picture more than this. Um, um, but we have four wonderful daughters, Kate, Emma, Avery, and Blake. Seven, five, three, and one. Um, and wish that they were here today. So, enough about me. What I want to talk to you today is about embracing uncertainty. To learn to not only to cope with but how do we thrive in the unknown? Because as much as we like to pretend otherwise, we live in an unpredictable world, a world that we cannot control. And I had an executive coach once tell me that the secret to success in all of the uh, entrepreneurs that he had worked with was their ability to stare into the face of a darkening abyss, to laugh, and then walk forward with confidence. And that's a terrifying proposition. I think that for many of us, myself included, we probably are a lot like my three-year-old who, when I tell her to put on her pajamas at night, stares down the dark hallway to her room and sees something like this. Uh, it's terrifying, it's dark, it's scary, she doesn't know what to do. And we naively, or maybe more appropriately, more kindly, optimistically, we like to chart our course thinking that it looks something like this. So if you have time on the x-axis and progress on the y, we like to think that success is sort of this stepwise function. It progresses linearly. When actually, it looks a whole lot more like this. 
The truth is that there's no magic bullets. There's no secret, set, no, no secret to success. And that everything that we do is a series of two steps forward, one step back. And it's not predictable. So my goal today is primarily to convince you to acknowledge and accept that uncertainty is okay. Even though it can be unsettling, uncomfortable, gut-wrenching, it's not fun, that doesn't make it bad. In fact, in those periods of darkness and most soul-shaking struggle, we often will find our greatest discoveries. Just ask the 14-year-old boy prophet who said, in the midst of this war of words and tumult of opinions, I often said to myself, what is to be done? Joseph experienced this. We experience this. I think the college experience is largely summarized by uncertainty, right? What am I going to major in? What am I going to do professionally? Am I going to seek advanced learning? Am I going to get a doctorate or a master's degree? Where am I going to go? How am I going to prepare? How am I going to prepare for it? Where, how am I going to pay for it? Is it weird to ask out my TA on a date? You know, these like super important questions. Um, how much time should we spend in social activities versus study? And I'll be honest, Crystal and I took a very different approach to this. So um, you should probably ask her opinion, not mine, um, on how you find that balance. And I don't pretend to have all of the answers. Um, but I do want to share with you three stories um, that illustrate lessons that I have learned and strategies that I have tried to build um, to help to cope with that. So those three strategies are, right, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them, is find rest in the Lord, plan by principles, and lean in and be patient. So the first, rest in the Lord. February 23rd, 2009, was a day that I for, I. I forgot how to walk. Um, Dr. Porter mentioned this briefly. So I was in my first year of medical school. We were one week away from block exams. I was a few weeks away from my 25th birthday, and I woke up with a splitting headache. And that wasn't unusual because I spent a lot of time studying, like 16-hour days, so bad posture, hunched over books with small text. Um, so I was not a stranger to headaches, but this one was different. I went into the bathroom to take some Tylenol, and I had such visual disturbance that I hadn't realized at this point that I slammed into the door frame, and I couldn't even read the word Tylenol on the bottle. Um, I just took a handful, swallowed it down. Um, as I looked up in the mirror, I realized that everything was slanted. And because I was standing on the side of my foot rather than the bottom of my foot. And it took incredible effort to straighten that back out. It was really, really weird. And as I did so, it felt like somebody snuck up behind me and poured a vessel of warm oil over the top of my head. But that oil never crossed midline. It always stayed on the left side. As that sensation went from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, I was losing all strength and all sensation. And I half stumbled, I half fell out into the room, and I called my roommate, who was a third-year med student at the time, and I said, John, I'm having a stroke. He bounded in laughing because one secret about medical students is we are all hypochondriacs. Um, you spend all day studying disease and so suddenly every headache must be meningitis. Um, and he was sure that this was the case. He realized very quickly that was not, um, called 911. And as we were waiting for the paramedics to arrive, I had him call my father. I needed to hear his voice. I just needed some comfort and stability. Um, and while my father was on the phone, I asked John, who was also in the Kelsey Priesthood Holder, to give me a blessing. I got real oil this time. And as he laid his hands on my head, and he gave me a blessing, I don't remember what he said. I know how it started. Justin Michael Frankleton, my father of the Melchizedek Priesthood. And the only words that I remember was that I was promised that I would fully recover with no residual effect. And just as real as that feeling of oil running down my head when I had the stroke was the feeling and the somatic response as the Spirit testified to me that that promise came from the Lord. I was terrified up until that moment. I had spent the better years of my life in a library. I had been locked overnight in the library because I missed closing time and they just locked up and left. Um, I hadn't done all that for this. But in that moment, all that fear, 
all that anxiety went away. And I knew that everything was going to be okay. Now, I didn't know all the details. I didn't know how long rehab and recovery was going to be. I didn't know how painful the process was going to be. I didn't know what would happen in my medical training. But I knew that everything was going to be okay. And that was transformative, both professionally, as upon graduation, it led me to a different path in healthcare, um, but also a spiritual learning. So what did I learn? I learned the importance of entering into the rest of the Lord. Anyone can survive uncertainty. We have no choice in that. But to thrive in uncertainty first requires entering into the Lord's rest. And I think, used to think that entering into the Lord's rest meant ascending these pearly steps, and walking through the gates, and curling up on a celestial armchair, and being in you know, the Lord's living room, and now, now I was in the rest of the Lord. But I realized that there's a different, perhaps more important definition of that. Have, have you ever been in a situation where you felt so afraid? Where everything seemed to be crashing down around you and was unmanageable. And in that moment, you thought, there's no way that I can go forward. There's no way that I can survive this. And not suicidally, but you think, I wish that I could just cease to exist. Make this all go away. I've been there. In, in the Book of Mormon, we read the, that now these ordinances are given that thereby the people might look forward to the Son of God, that they might enter into the rest of the Lord. And again, I used to think it was this thing that happened in the future. But I think that there's a second meaning that this experience of the stroke taught me that is more instructive and more meaningful now. And that is the perfect assurance that comes from knowing the end from the beginning. I think that's what it means to enter into the rest of the Lord. In my case, I didn't get a full play-by-play. -play. I didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but I knew how it was going to end. Imagine homecoming this weekend. We knew right now who was going to win the football game. It, didn't, it wouldn't matter how many touchdowns Boise made. It wouldn't matter how many bad calls, because we would know we were going to win. Everything was going to be okay. Now, that doesn't mean that hard tackles are not going to hurt. And it doesn't mean that we should needlessly just press on bruises over and over again. But what it does mean is that none of that really matters when we know that we're on the winning team. And I think that this concept puts for what is perhaps one of the most recognizable or memorable verses in LDS scripture in a new light. In Nephi we read, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. And as a young kid, I used to always put the emphasis on I will go and do. Because I thought that was the powerful part. That was the part to be proud of. But I've come to learn that I think the most important part of this is that Nephi knew the things which the Lord had commanded him. And that was the secret to his faith. That was why he could fail and fail and keep getting up and keep trying, right? We know that the first time he tried using logic and reasoning power. The second time he tried using money and purchasing power. But what he had to learn is that none of those were the currencies for learning the mind and the will of the Lord. He had to learn that the comfort and the security that comes by knowing the Lord's will is a spiritual process. And that is why he was able to go forward in faith, not knowing beforehand the things which he was supposed to do. Story two. For plan by principles. So I'm now in medical school, I've gotten past the stroke, I'm approaching graduation, and at this point in time, we were talking earlier, Texas schools are pretty inexpensive, it's wonderful. But I still had, just from medical school, um, and my, my business degree, somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 worth of debt. Um, and I got married over the course of this time, and my wife tells me afterwards, she says, you know, I always knew that I was going to marry a doctor. Um, I was going to her Mark, I guess. <laughs> And, um, and so here I am, and I've had this experience with the stroke, and it's made me rethink how do I help people be better. I could go in a one-on-one -on -one patient to provider sort of encounter, I could do a lot of good. But there's also a macro approach here of how rather than laying hands on somebody to heal them, can I put devices on people to heal them and give them information of what their body's trying to tell them that maybe they don't already know. And so I go to my wife, I say, look, I think that 
we should take a different path. And along the way, I've been doing a lot of work kind of building this. It wasn't the first time we've talked about it, but here's what happens is that if you've ever been through or, or, you know, or have seen everybody go through or are familiar with the process, there's something called the National Residency Match Program, which is basically this not-for-profit group that sits in between all medical school applicants and all residency programs. Um, and all of the programs are required to fill all of their spots through the NR NRMP. And um, that's because there's a lot of applicants, there's a small number of spots, and it just create chaos if people were going kind of different ways. And on this applicant side, it also means that once you get in, you are legally bound to go there. Um, you can't say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm good later. Um, because otherwise there's, there's going to be uh, important gaps in care at these, at these programs. And so November of 2012, I'm about to go through this, uh, this match program. I did all my interviews, I did all my way rotations, I've gotten all my letters of recommendation, filled out the applications and all that. Um, but come November, we're still probably three to four months away from raising our first financing um, for this startup that I was interested in. So I go to my wife and say, here's the deal. $150,000, I think we can raise a little bit of money. But in order to take that chance, I'm gonna have to give up the last eight years of education and training and put that all in the balance because if we don't raise money, I've gotta wait another year before I can apply again. And I may have burned some bridges by virtue of the fact that I went and interviewed and now I just dropped out. But this is a great idea, honey. Trust me, this is all gonna work out. Um, and we talked about it for a long time. She finally, she came to me and she said, Dustin, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. But she said, I've seen you come back from the hospital and I've seen you come back from your project at the time. And she said, I know where you're the happiest. And for me, that's all I needed because I knew where I was happiest. And that became an easy then decision for me. So I guess the, the cat is already, you know, it's a, the surprise is already out. I did not go through um, with medical school, but what did I learn? First, marry well. Um, her guidance and her advice in that was the catalyzing moment that I needed in order to make this incredibly hard decision. There was a lot on the line. It went against everything that I had ever planned for. It went against my very nature, but I felt that it was the right thing to do and I had her full support. But more appropri appropriately for at least this setting, um, what I learned is that proper planning is not an exercise of turn-by-turn -turn itineraries. It's not creating a to-do list. First, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to go here, then I'm going to get this promotion. Then you know, it, That's not how planning, I think, best works. Um, I think, instead, an introspective and honest process of identifying and living by a core code of principles is a far more effective way to plan than trying to plan to the outcome. We spend more time worrying about where am I gonna be in two years or five years or 10 years or 50 years, which are things that are completely outside of our control that we don't focus on the more important, how am I going to get there? When you consider all of the things that are outside of our control, and you start to add up if you're planning for this future destination, all of these events that have to fall into place, all these events that are outside of your control, all these events that have very small probabilities and you multiply all these multi-probability events out, the likelihood of actually getting to this destination that you think you can envision in the future is infinitesimally small. There really is a low likelihood of being able to get exactly where your mind's eye was in 50 years. Now, I'm not saying don't plan. Please don't walk away with that. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is plan for and focus on the things that are in your control. How am I going to get there? Not the things that are outside of your control. Where am I going to be and what's gonna to happen to me? Having no plan will expose you to significant risk of acting in ways that are inconsistent with what you value most and what your goals and your aspirations are. And so to make this a little bit more practical, um, this is where the, pri the principle of uh, principle place planning comes in. I wanna propose three steps. One, what to ask yourself, what do I want? Two, asking yourself, what is true? And three, what choices will help me achieve one in light of two? And I take some liberty here to modify some of these concepts that come from Ray Dalio, um, founder of Bridgewater Capital, a fantastic book called Principles. Um, but I, 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 love, I love this concept. Um, as for me, my goal, what do I want? 
I did not want to have to work a day in my life. What is true? I knew that if I loved what I was doing, it would not be work. It would be play, it would be fun, I would look forward to going and doing it. And probably my wife will say I love it a little bit too much. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but three, then what choices will help me to get to one in light of two? Well, I needed to excel in my predetermined field of study, but I also needed to be willing to be open and to explore other things and other opportunities as they came along. Um, as you do this, you have to be a relentless prioritizer. Good, better, and best, right, as Elder Oaks says. Focusing on the things that are most important and more, most valuable in our lives and putting that first. For me, studying with a girlfriend never worked um, because it didn't help me to get to my goal. I couldn't, I couldn't try to do two things at the same time. And that was one example where, um, where that just did not work for me. There's no such thing as multitasking. That's probably one of the best proven facts in neurosciences. Um, and long before neuroscientists had fMRIs or before there was such thing as, uh, as, as like clinical or, 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 or behavioral economists, um, Albert Einstein identified this principle. And he said, anyone who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. <laughs> um, you cannot multitask. You cannot do two things well at the same time. Um, that includes, for me, not taking my work home. Working when I'm at work and being with my family when I'm with my family. I mean, these important choices of am I going to study on the Sabbath? What am I going to do to honor the Sabbath and to keep it holy versus to, prefer, to further my professional, my educational pursuits? What do I want? What is true? And what do I need to do to get there? We have to take time for what matters most. About four years ago, I, um, I had the opportunity, I was late unfortunately, to attend my then uh, uh, pre-kindergartners uh, a program that she had through the Community Arts Center. She was really excited for me to be there. I showed up a little bit late. Um, but I came, I came up to the stage afterwards where she was waiting and she was just beaming, the excitement of the presentation, as well as the opportunity to introduce me to the first, for the first time to some of her friends. And she introduces me to her friends, she says, Dad, this is so-and-so, they're going on a vacation. And after about a second, that big, youthful smile fades, and she goes, Dad, what's a vacation? <laughs> that was like a dagger to the heart. I've repented. Um, and I can tell you after this, we're going to spend some time on a family vacation. So she knows what that is. And she knows where my priorities are. But we have to learn to prioritize and put the most important things first. My last, my last point is lean in and be patient. So I've now had my stroke. I've now gone through. We successfully raised money that first time. We're in March of 2017. And I've been fundraising at this point for about 14 months. And that's a long time. We had technically, for all intents and purposes, run out of money in February. But with a little bit of creativity um, and slow paying some vendors and other sorts of things, we were able to eke out just one more month. And I found myself in the Bay Area. I had a 10 day trip. And this was literally my last opportunity to try to raise money. I was terrified because I knew that failure, as much as I like to believe was not an option, was a real option. And that if I didn't raise all of those dreams, all of those hopes, all of those sacrifices, I don't want to say it would have been for nothing, but it would have been for nothing. <laughs> um, I was worried. So I'm in the Bay Area and I'm meeting with venture capitalists one after another. I've met with hundreds at this point sending out pitch decks, taking meetings, having several meetings progress pretty significantly. It was just a hard environment to be raising in. We were a wearables company. We were focusing on healthcare analytics. Investors didn't really understand that. They were interested in software as service and IT sort of related things. It was hard. Um, and I had one particularly good uh, meeting that day. Um, I was feeling pretty good about myself. It was a first meeting, no money exchanges hands after a first meeting. But I got on the Caltrain from Palo Alto going up to San Francisco. And in that moment of sort of 
appreciation rather than taking a nap or opening up Hulu or doing something to kind of make the time pass, I opened a book that I was reading by Robert Millet. And the section that he was uh, talking about at the time was about expressing gratitude in the moment. And I thought, well, this is a, an important and uh, appropriate time to do that. So I closed the book, I bowed my head, and I offered a prayer. And as I offered that prayer, I heard the words, now sit back and watch. This is not you. This is me. And I opened my eyes and I looked around and there was nobody there. The train was bustling, but it was pretty, you know, it was just there was a, the track and no people around. And it wasn't that voice that I heard in my ears. It was a voice that I heard in my head. There were no lights. There were no angelic visitors. There was nothing like that. But with that thought, probably more appropriately a thought than a voice, but with that thought came a perfect assurance. Because I knew my weaknesses. I knew my failings. I knew my insecurities. And if if I focused on that, I would have had no hope of being able to raise. But knowing that the Lord was on my side, that he had my back, now sit back and watch, was an incredibly reassuring message. It was powerful. To know that the Lord was fighting my battle with me. That I was not alone. This was March. I keep going. It wasn't until December of 2017 that we closed the second round of our Series A financing. Nine months later. Now, after that, after that moment, I know I told you that I was about out of money, we had a little bit of sort of hope for success so that our existing investors gave us a short leash and a little bit of bridge financing to be able to keep going and kind of just puttering along. We completed our first close in July, but the second close and the full financing that was needed to actually operate the company forward looking was not completed until nine months later. And I tell you the story knowing that I risk you focusing on the wrong thing. And perhaps it's partially driven by the way that I told it. But I don't want you to focus on the fact that we raised. I don't want you to focus on the impression that I would receive. I want you to focus on the nine months. Sometimes we focus so much on something to the exclusion of others that we miss the forest through the trees. We miss the 10,000 foot grill in the room. Um, this is a screen grab from a video. Has anybody ever seen this video? Okay, most people have. Um, for those of you who haven't, it's, it's fascinating. It's a, it's a lesson on inattention blindness or situational awareness. And so, I don't know, it's like three or four minutes or so. What you have going on here is you have a group of people that are playing basketball. And as a viewer, as the test subject, your job is to pay attention to the people in white shirts and to count how many times they're passing the ball to each other. Now at this time, they're bouncing, dribbling, moving all over the place. You've got obviously non-white shirt entities that are at play here. Um, and about halfway through, you have a woman in a gorilla suit who enters from stage right, walks across to the middle of the screen, stops, beats her chest a few times, and then exits. And the subjects who viewed this are asked what they saw. And you know, half of the people who watched this video never saw this gorilla beating their chest in the, front of, in the center of the screen. They were focusing on the wrong thing. And if you go back and you watch it a second time, knowing what you're looking for, it's painfully obvious. It's there. But that's the risk of focusing on the wrong place. That's the risk of getting ourselves so myopically focused on something that is not as important. And for me, for this story, what I would argue, and it's my story so I can argue it, is that the time that lapsed is the most important aspect. Um, because the greatest growth is not in the sign. The greatest growth occurs in patiently waiting and watching, in being able to reconcile faith and fear, doubt, and determination over and over and over again. We're in school here. We understand that the diploma is far less valuable to you in your learning and development and growth than were the years of patient study and sacrifice to get there. Yet we're wired to think about diplomas and signs and voices and lights as the thing that really matters when what's truly important is the process of getting there. Pain plus reflection equals progress. I want to promise you that the most profound moments of awakening and self-determination will come during those darkest times. Don't be afraid of them. 
Don't try to engineer them out of your lives. You have to struggle. You have to fight. And there will be times where you think that you cannot go on, where you think that you have nothing left to give, and you want to curl up on the floor and make it all go away. Trust me, I've been there. But in those moments of struggle, I promise you as well that you will find a deeper wellspring of strength than you ever thought possible. And there is no other way to discover that. I think we see this in the story of, of Nephi. In 3 Nephi chapter 1, we are, have a group of people that are patiently waiting for the sign of the Savior's birth. Five years earlier, a prophet had come, Samuel and said that there would be signs in the heavens, that there would be a new star, that there would be all of these cosmic displays that would be occurring to indicate to the people that this miracle had happened. For five years, they had to wait. Think about that. All the opposition, all the people telling them you're foolish, all the people saying he was a false prophet, you are crazy for believing him. Now a date has been set by the non-believers, not by Samuel, but by the non-believers on which all of the faithful are going to be executed. And what do they do? They go into the city center, they kneel, they wait with swords over their heads for the moment of execution, of execution to occur. And what happens? The sun sets, but the sky does not darken. And there is a day, a night, and a day with no darkness. And again, in this story, at least myself, my tendency is to focus on that miracle. Oh, Samuel was right. But I think the real lesson here is in the five years that these faithful Nephites had to wait and had to struggle and had to develop for themselves a conviction that led to their behavior and their choices in that moment. That's the true miracle of the story. So to summarize... Find rest in the world. <coughs> Plan by principles. Lean in and be patient. I want to testify to you that life is hard. You know that. But it doesn't have to be frightening. That there is security in knowing what the Lord would have you do. And that with that perfect knowledge comes faith. Faith to do and to become and to accomplish and to go places that you never thought were possible. And to be honest, by yourselves, by ourselves, is not possible. But we can do far more through Christ who strengthens us. I'm grateful to BYU for the opportunity I had to study here and to learn some of those life principles and to carry it forward. And I appreciate the time I've had to spend with you today. Thank you. question. We just sold a, a week ago, and there's a lot of work that we're doing right now in setting up a new company and uh, um, working towards a, a new product vision, so there's not a lot that I can or should say on that right now. <laughs> so, it's not a big question, but what were the things during your med school experience that you saw, or maybe it, it was before, but uh, what were the kind of things that led you to decide that this was that you wanted and you had the life that would rock through this? That's a, that's a great question. So for me, probably the biggest thing goes back to wanting to be silly passionate about what I was doing. Um, and despite all of the rotations and the shadowing and things that I had done prior to med school, I realized that just for me, that wasn't really what... I loved quite as much as I thought that I would. Um, now I have to say, I really enjoyed orthopedic surgery, and I could have been happy doing that. 
but it was more of an optimization decision, right? I wasn't trying to avoid <coughs> being unhappy, I was trying to maximize happiness. Um, and so that was one of the big things for me. Um, I won't get into the failings of healthcare and chronic disease management, we can talk about that later, those also had a, a part in it. Um, but I just wanted to be able to wake up every morning loving what I was doing, and for me, that was, that was the path that I chose. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, sorry. Uh, so you talked a lot about like those experiences where you had that feeling of like, it's gonna be okay now, or like, I'm here with you, watch what happens next, and like, that's great in the moment, but how do you maintain that through the months or years later, you don't see that like immediate, like, oh, it's better now, like, how do you keep that uh, thought in the mind of like, the Lord is with me? <laughs> I wish I had a good answer to that, because in that moment of clarity, the light is always the brightest, and then later on, it starts to dim, and it's a struggle to keep that. And I would, I would be lying to you if I said that I never experienced anxiety or fear that nine months waiting for his financing. But I would also be lying to you if I said that that knowledge was not what allowed me to push through. And, you know, I, one, of my, one of my favorite movies, I have somewhat of a, a juvenile taste for, for movies, but I, I really like the... Uh, Batman, I guess Batman Begins, um, and in there, Bruce Wayne's father says to him, Bruce, why do we fall? It's so we can learn to pick ourselves back up again. Um, I, I love that. <laughs> um, and I feel like for me, that nine months was a process of being allowed to repeatedly fall and pick myself back up again. But without that moment <coughs> of clarity, of knowing the Lord's will, I truly don't believe that I would have had the wherewithal to continue to pick myself up time and time again. Because there were, there were dark times. There were times where my wife would attest, I would literally go into the closet, close the door, curl up, and just recoil at the smallest sensation of light or noise or anything else. It was, it was tough. But having that knowledge was my source of strength to be able to make it through. Yeah, yeah, so you graduate med school, you have all the debt from med school. How did you find just like the mindset or just the courage to say, let's go to a startup right now? Like, Ignorance is bliss, man. Yeah, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, I can't tell you that I make different choices. Um, but, you know, when there's something that you're excited about, there's something that you want more than anything, you're willing to do anything to get there. And if it were easy, everybody would be doing it, right? But um, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think that's probably the most important thing, is just finding what you love and being willing and able to commit yourself fully to it. <laughs> so you put a lot of time, stress, effort into this first company. What were some decisions that led you to selling it? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So I think we kind of re reached the, the natural end um, of the company. And what, we're, what, what I see that was in, sell, in selling was not really a terminal event. It was really a graduating event for us. Um, in, so seven years, seven months, and 17 days from when we started incorporated to when we sold. Um, we raised 13.7, we now have 50, a pretty significant war chest. Um, I see that as an incredible opportunity to continue the work that the team is so passionate about, to continue doing what I love and why I walked away from a clear career in medicine, um, and an opportunity to kind of take it to a larger stage than we ever could have on our own. Um, so, you know, people have different exit strategies, um, people start and build and sell companies for different reasons. For us, it was really the ability to be able to maximize impact in human life and well-being, and that takes a lot of money, and this was our opportunity to be able to do that. So let's thank again Dr. Freckleton for coming to